Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, MABA Great Montana Egg Rally. Thank you for participating. Uh, this is a great series of one hour educational workshops that we hope will help our membership continue to stay informed and up to speed on the latest technology and information. We want to give a thank you to Nutrien for their support of the rally and sponsoring this session. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, we hope to be able to share it at a later date if you need to go back and look at some data or uh, anything that you uh, want to revisit. So we're going to start this off. We're going to have a short video from our sponsor, Nutrien. So we'll start with that. Um, we'll come out of the video and we will get rolling into the presentation by uh, Dr. Blaylock. Uh, please enjoy the following video from our sponsor, Nutrien. We serve a big world with growing needs. And we see the big picture that a world with over seven and a half billion people today and nearly 10 billion by 2050 needs to grow more food and to grow food more efficiently. Nutrien will be there to help. We have more than 20,000 people committed to making sustainable food production a reality by working with growers to deliver bigger, healthier harvests each year. Nutrien is the world's largest integrated provider of crop inputs, insights, and services. And even though food production is as old as civilization, we treat each day as a new opportunity for discovery and innovation. We deliver products and ideas to improve crop production and soil fertility. And the proper use of crop nutrients, like the ones we produce, account for 50% of the increase in global crop yields. We're also working to grow stronger relationships with customers and communities. Because even though our field is global agriculture, our business is about people. Our number one priority is safety and protecting the well-being of employees, suppliers and the areas where we work and live. The people who are part of our team are active in other fields too. They're parents and neighbors, volunteers and organizers. And they help create a company and communities built on integrity, inclusion and innovation. That's how we can grow, together. Nutrien operates four interrelated business units, retail, potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. We are a global company with more than two dozen production facilities, over 1,600 retail locations, and distribution centers, investments, and partnerships on six continents. It's a vast network capable of serving every major growing region in the world. Our retail network operates as Nutrien Ag Solutions, with thousands of crop advisors, agronomists and scientists working in North America, South America and Australia. In addition to supplying seed, crop nutrients and crop protection products, we explore new ways to help growers maximize yields and improve crop quality, investing in precision agricultural technology that can help farmers optimize the way they use and protect the planet's resources and developing digital tools to make information as much a part of crop production as seed and soil. To support these advances, Nutrien maintains significant production capabilities in each of the three primary crop nutrients. Our potash operations are based in Saskatchewan, where we have large-scale, low-cost operations and extensive reserves of high-quality ore. These operations have capacity of more than 20 million metric tons, making Nutrien the world's largest potash producer. Potash is drawn from mineral deposits almost a kilometer below the Earth's surface. We mine and process the raw ore to deliver a plant-friendly nutrient to customers in North America and to growers around the world as a partner in Canpotex. In nitrogen, we have more than a dozen facilities in Canada and the United States, as well as a large-scale facility in Trinidad. Nutrien is the world's third largest nitrogen producer, with more than 10 million metric tons of annual production. Unlike nutrients that are mined from the earth, nitrogen is found in the air. We combine nitrogen with hydrogen and convert these gases to liquid and solid products that can be applied to crops or used in industrial applications. In phosphate, Nutrien is the second largest producer in North America, with more than 3 million tons of production in the United States. Phosphate comes from the fossilized remains of ancient sea life, and we have access to large deposits of high-quality phosphate rock in North Carolina and Florida. 
The quality of the ore of these deposits lets us provide a wide range of finished products for fertilizer, food ingredients, animal feed, and industrial uses. Combined, these four business units make it possible for Nutrien to provide customers with an efficient, reliable supply from people who know the demand of producing corn in North America, soybeans in Brazil, or rice in Asia. Where crops are growing, Nutrien is growing too. Because in the big picture, we're working together to grow our world from the ground up. All right, thank you, Nutrien. Now we're going to get into uh, the introduction of our presenter, Mr. Dr. Alan Blaylock. Dr. Alan Blaylock earned a PhD in soil fertility from Iowa State University in 1989 and a BS and MS degrees in agronomy from Brigham Young University. He has supported marketing, sales, and product development for Nutrien since joining in 1996 and has managed research and education programs in key global markets such as North America, Europe, and China. He joined Nutrien, formerly Agrium, after serving as Extension Soil Specialist at the University of Wyoming. Allen has served numerous regional and national committees and as chair of multiple divisions in the American Society of Agronomy and the Soil Science Society of America. He was recognized in 2018 by SSSA with the Soil Science Industry and Professional Leadership Award and in 2010 by the ASA with the Agronomic Industry Award. Alan is a recognized expert in the fertilizer industry on various nutrient management topics and has spoken on nutrient management at numerous national and international conferences. Mr. Blaylock, it's all yours. Thanks, Jake. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today and I uh, hope that you will all uh, get something from my presentation this morning that will be useful to you. We're going to be talking about potassium and chloride, two essential plant nutrients that coincidentally come in the same fertilizer, something we call potash. So let's uh, get into it. So a uh, question sometimes comes up, do Montana soils need potash? Uh, we hear this a, a bit from some of our customers, some um, questions about that. And so let's uh, hopefully try to answer that. Potassium, um, potash, I should say, which uh, usually refers to potassium chloride, although the word potash can be used generically to refer to any of our potash fertilizers, but most commonly uh, refers to potassium chloride, sometimes called muriate of potash or MOB, contains two essential nutrients. And both of these nutrients, potassium and chloride, have similar functions in the plant. Unfortunately, uh, we have a bit of a challenge in our plain soils in that potassium is often very high and chloride low. So sometimes <clears throat> we can have excess of one nutrient and deficiency of another. One of the things that's interesting about these nutrients uh, to me, particularly in relation to dryland cropping in Montana, is that they're both involved with water regulation in the plant. So we want to make sure that particularly under these dry land conditions where we're almost always growing the crop under some degree of moisture stress, that these nutrients are supplied in adequate amounts. Also, uh, somewhat related is, is that both of these nutrients are also have also been shown to improve plant tolerance and resistance to a variety of diseases. So these uh, nutrients are related. They occur together frequently in nature as salts, they're common salts in, in seawater and in the deposits deep under the ground that we harvest as, as potash fertilizer. So here's some uh, very recent data, hot off the presses. Um, it's actually not been published yet, so consider this draft data because the report hasn't been finalized, but here's the most recent soil test inventory from the Fertilizer Institute. And this is simply a collection of data from soil testing labs who submit their data to this inventory every five years. And you can see uh, data going back here to 2001 and a number of samples from Montana being represented. But if we look at the distribution of potassium soil tests for Montana, we can see that 
uh, over here on the right of the chart, we, we have a large percentage, um, almost 40% of the samples that are testing very high. Uh, this is fairly normal for the Great Plains. Um, it's similar in some of the other Plains states. And I've circled here kind of the range where Montana State University uses as, as the critical level, as we say, the, the level above which we don't expect further plant response. And I've uh, taken an excerpt from the uh, fertilizer guidelines for Montana crops, the Montana uh, Extension Publication EB161. And I've taken just a portion of that table to kind of show you where the response to potassium lies. So uh, at about 250 parts per million for most of the crops, we um, stop seeing a response uh, at soil test levels above that. But if we look at this chart, there are a number of soils. While it's, a, it's not a majority of the soils, there are a number of soils in Montana that are deficient in potassium and would need potassium applications. So how do we know uh, when we need that potassium? Well, the very best method we have for evaluating that is the soil test. It's a, a quite a good indicator, fairly reliable indicator for uh, potassium crop response. But I want you to think about that soil test as a probability indicator. And I, I kind of came to this um, way of thinking with some work I was doing at the University of Wyoming with with some of the nutrients and, and trying to explain some of the responses that we were seeing. But it, it's a fairly simple concept. And it simply is that in soils that test very high, we have a low probability of getting a response. It doesn't mean we'll never get a response, but that response will be infrequent. And, and if there is one, it will probably be small. On the other hand, on the left side of the chart, <clears throat> in very low testing soils, we have a high probability of getting a response. It doesn't mean we will always get a response, but the probability is high and that response will usually be large when it occurs. So as we think about this in relation to these potassium soil tests in Montana and going back to that slide, we want to manage potassium to optimize that crop response or the probability of getting that response. And sometimes there are interactions with other nutrients. If one nutrient is deficient, we may not get the response to the targeted nutrient that we're looking at. So this really speaks to balanced crop nutri nutrition and making sure that everything is in, uh, in balance at the, at the right amounts. So again, the soil test is our best indicator and you can look up the values for recommended potassium applications in this publication, which is uh, um, obtainable from uh, Montana State University Cooperative Extension and um, that's uh, easily found. Okay, so let's look at some of the different crops that we might be growing because potassium removal in the crop uh, begins to play a large role depending on what we're growing. So for example, as we look down this list, there are a few crops that stand out as large potassium removers. Alfalfa, for example, uh, takes up a lot of potassium and keep in mind when we're harvesting forages, or corn silage, these crops, we're removing the entire crop. And a lot of the potassium is in the straw or in the stems and leaves and, and does not get translocated into the grain. So when we remove an entire crop like corn silage, we're taking all of that potassium off. So if we're on a soil that is maybe borderline or deficient in potassium, uh, that could become a problem very quickly if we're not replacing that crop removal. If our soil is four or 500 parts per million potassium, then we probably don't need to worry about that for a very long time, but it's still important to occasionally run that soil test to monitor that. So when we look down at the, the grass and forage grasses, the alfalfa, keep those crops in mind. Also for some of the irrigated growers growing sugar beets or potatoes, those are very large potassium removers that's less likely to be a problem uh, because those growers are typically applying potassium every year that crop is grown. So they're uh, virtually always soil testing and managing that for those high value crops. 
Now, one thing to note, and, and this table, which I pulled from Montana State uh, Extension publication, um, one thing to note is that the removal values for the grains, barley and wheat, include the, um, the straw. And in most of the time we won't be harvesting that. So these potassium removal values will be much lower in, in those crops where we're just harvesting grains. So just keep that in mind. So some of the conditions that we might want to pay attention to that might be indicators uh, along with that soil test of potential potassium response, certainly soil test. Um, a good soil scientist, that's our common advice for many different uh, issues, take a soil test. That's our first indicator. If we're growing crops on low county exchange soils, these are the sandy soils, they don't have a lot of capacity to hold potassium, soil tests will usually be lower uh, for potassium on those. Uh, that's another situation where we want to pay particular attention. High yielding crops where we're removing more potassium. Forage crops, as I mentioned, we're removing the whole crop. And those high value or irrigated crops, we're, we're managing those a bit more intensively because we, we're removing moisture as a limitation. But as a caution, we want to avoid excessive potassium application. First of all, it's an economic loss. You put something on and don't get, you spend money on an input and don't get a response to that. You don't get a payback off of that response. So that's the first best reason to, to avoid uh, excessive applications. But the other reason is that we may create nutrient imbalances. And this can be particularly important in, in forage grasses where we're concerned about potassium magnesium balance and, and having excess potassium can reduce the magnesium uptake and create nutritional problems in the animals that we're feeding. So certainly, again, pay attention to that soil test. If we have those extremely high soil test potassium values, um, we, we don't want to be applying additional potassium. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the other half and we'll spend more of our time on this nutrient. So, does chloride, the other half of that potassium, that potash, deserve my attention? And this is something that's been studied a great deal in the Great Plains over the last really several decades. <clears throat> chloride is an essential nutrient of all plants and, and most animals. And, and sometimes we don't think about this a lot, but it is an essential micronutrient. The name of the element chemically is chlorine. But when we talk about it as a plant nutrient, we use the term chloride, which is the naturally occurring stable form of the element. Chlorine gas doesn't really exist in nature. We can manufacture it, uh, but, but the element chloride, chlorine in nature uh, virtually always occurs as the chloride ion in, in various salts. <clears throat> chloride is commonly found together with both sodium and potassium. And these salts are abundant in nature. Chlorine is one of the most uh, abundant elements in our, in our ecosystem atmosphere. Uh, there's gases in the atmosphere as well as salts in the, in the ground and in the ocean water, particularly is a, is a large reservoir of chloride salts. <clears throat> chloride has many important functions in the plant and, and I won't read through all of these in detail, but you can see there are many important roles in uh, regulating water and nutrient transport. Uh, both potassium and chloride are involved in regulating the stomates that control water movement uh, through the leaves and tran the transpiration stream. Uh, chloride is also, like potassium, uh, can strengthen stems and reduce late season lodging and, as I mentioned before, increase disease tolerance. There are a, a large number of diseases uh, particularly in wheat, where it's been most noted, but also in many other crops, there are a large number of diseases that can be suppressed, at least in part, by chloride. And again, potassium also plays a similar role. So if we have more disease pressure, we have to use more uh, chemical controls, fungicides, and things like that. So maintaining good plant nutrition uh, and nutrient balance can help us with our pesticide management as well. So one of the uh, first uh, indicators in wheat of um, a chloride response 
was back in the late 70s and early 80s in, in Oregon, there was um, some observations that chloride reduced take all in winter wheat. And so as they began to study this, and this was some of the, the pioneering work on, on chloride nutrition, began to study this and observe that they were seeing suppression of the disease and began to look at some other things and identified uh, a variety of diseases that, that were also affected. So as they observed this disease suppression and, and these reports were being published, um, it led to greater interest in the Great Plains and Earl Scobley and Vince Habe in Montana began to study this soon after uh, and work on, uh, particularly on cereal grains spread throughout the plains. And at first they thought, well, we're getting responses to potassium chloride on these high potassium soils. What's going on here? Do we have a problem with our soil test? calibration. And, and as they began to study it more and isolate with different sources, it was determined that the chloride response um, appeared to be part of the reason for these responses to potash. So in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, about the time I joined um, Nutrien's predecessor, Agrium, there were some large regional projects studying chloride response uh, uh, throughout the Great Plains from the Canadian prairies all the way down to Texas and, and looking uh, particularly at cereals, uh, especially wheat, uh, but also sorghum and corn in some of that research. <clears throat> One of um, Montana State's uh, fine soil scientists, Dr. Rick Engel, who recently retired, was uh, the first to characterize what is now called chloride deficient leaf spot syndrome or sometimes called physiological leaf spot or PLS. And he was the first to uh, identify this as a, as a physiological spot because the, the disease symptoms were showing up, but um, the organism, there was no disease organism affiliated with it. So, so as they studied that, um, really learned that this was really a chloride nutrient deficiency. And so he, uh, he observed that in a variety of wheat. Uh, here's some examples, uh, some photos from leaf spot in chloride leaf spot in Durham wheat. And so this began to be one of the symptoms, but interestingly, not all varieties show the leaf spotting. They can be deficient and don't show the spotting. And, and so it, it's not in and of itself a clear, reliable indicator of chloride deficiency because some varieties don't show the spotting, even though they may be deficient. So <clears throat> this, was, uh, this work was published by Dr. Engel and um, it occurs when chloride in the leaf tissue is below about 0.1%. There are some indications in some other states that that critical level may even be a bit higher, or when soil test chloride is deficient, uh, less than say about 10 parts per million. But as I mentioned, it's not exhibited uh, by all varieties and there are a variety of some other symptoms, but there's not one distinctive symptom that applies to all varieties. So, so really, while that may be an indicator, it's not an indicator we can use um, as a fail safe in, in all cases. So we really have to rely on soil and plant testing, which are uh, pretty reliable indicators. There are several sources of chloride in the environment. We have in some areas of the country, significant atmospheric deposition. We'll talk just a bit more about that. Obviously potash fertilizer, anytime we're applying potassium chloride as a fertilizer for for um, potassium nutrition, we get chloride um, along with that. There's chloride salts in manures and sometimes in irrigation water. These are the most common sources that, that we might see uh, in agriculture. Chloride um, can be susceptible to leaching losses. It's uh, an anion. It's not held on the cation exchange sites. So when we have excess moisture moving through the profile, it can be removed from the soil. Uh, in much the same way as nitrate nitrogen. The other major removal from the cropping system would be crop removal. And again, like any other nutrient, when we remove the crop, uh, we take some of the nutrient with it. 
So here's a map of the United States. This is published by the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. It's a program of EPA. They monitor a, a variety of elements in the atmosphere and the deposition um, to the earth. And you can see along the coastal areas, we have very high deposition of chloride. This is uh, airborne salts coming off the oceans in the, in the mist. And they're deposited close to the source of water. You see also some being deposited around the Great Salt Lake. Again, a large body of water with um, high chloride salts. But throughout the plains, you see very low deposition values. So we have this low deposition from the atmosphere coupled with high potassium in our soils. So we're, we're often not applying potassium in these dry land cropping systems where soil test K is high, yields are relatively low um, in the dry land system, so we don't need as much potassium. So we often don't even apply any, and that leads to these chloride deficiencies because we don't have another source. So this is part of the driver of these chloride responses throughout the Great Plains that, that have been observed historically. So where should I consider chloride fertilization? Well, certainly, as we said, where potassium fertilization is minimal, uh, away from the coastal areas, anywhere we have high fungal disease pressure, it's something we should examine and certainly consider soil testing for that. If we're growing responsive crops, and particularly the cereals seem to be the most responsive. Responses have been observed in other crops, including soybeans and, and uh, some of the other broadleaves, but the cereals, um, are, seem to be the most responsive. Our best indicators, as I mentioned, soil and plant analysis. And these are fairly reliable um, indicators. If the soil test is low, there's a high probability of getting a response. And also we want to consider if we're growing crops that may be sensitive to excess chloride, um, we want to consider that. And again, the soil test indicator can, can tell us about that. And we'll also want to look at the species uh, particularly horticultural species would be where this would be most commonly observed. So here's uh, similar data to what we showed for uh, potassium. This is our soil test distribution. Um, and one thing that I noted in this data is a change in the distribution uh, since the last inventory. So our 2020 soil test inventory, our most recent samples are showing um, more samples in the deficient range, less than four parts per million, and a reduction in the samples at high soil tests. So I'm not sure what this is telling us, but it seems to be an indicator that perhaps less chloride is being used, perhaps uh, we've had some leaching loss from the soil. Perhaps we've had wet years and, re and, and higher yields and removed more crop. There's a, a variety of things that could be contributing that. But what it says to me is we uh, maybe should renew our attention on chloride and, and uh, be doing more soil testing and, and perhaps more fertilization as warranted by the soil test. If we look at the map of the U.S., now the map is not yet available for the 2020 uh, survey, but um, we can see from the 2015 uh, soil test inventory that this is a common case throughout the, the Great Plains. Um, roughly half of our soils appear to be deficient in soil test chloride and even into the Western Corn Belt. So these are indications that we should be paying attention to this nutrient. So should I be concerned? Well, we have to ask some questions. Can chloride significantly influence crop growth and development? Well, uh, we've kind of answered that. There's plenty of evidence uh, out there for that response. Does chloride influence the crops I manage? If I'm growing a crop that's not particularly responsive, then maybe I don't need to worry about it so much. Is it an important factor in my trade area? Are, are others around me seeing that response or seeing that need? And can it be managed economically? That's always the question. There are lots of problems we can solve, uh, but maybe not economically. Maybe in our dry land cropping systems with low yield, it's not profitable. So uh, I want to address that as well. So here's a, 
a summary of a collection of data from a large number of Great Plains studies. You can see, see the states listed there um, from Montana down into Texas across the Dakotas. So in over 200 evaluations, we have a range of response from a slight uh, decrease in yield to uh, up to 18 bushels per acre increase. The average of all of those evaluations was 2.4 bushel increase. So that considers responsive and non-responsive sites uh, and varieties that are not responsive So and, and high testing soils. The frequency of a statistically significant response was almost 50%. So uh, that seems to correspond to our soil test inventory map. Uh, roughly half of the soils in the plains are uh, deficient by soil test, and we're seeing roughly half of the evaluation showing a significant response. So if we look at those significant responses, the average of those was about five bushels per acre yield increase with added chloride. So I took those numbers and I did a little bit of uh, what I call agronomy math. I kind of simplified. I simply took a yield increase and multiplied by the price of wheat and I subtracted off the cost of the chloride and uh, my price assumptions are there at the bottom. And so using that, um, those values with a 20 pound chloride application, I came up with an average profit response of about $6 per acre. So even using that two and a half bushel average, I still have a profit of about six bushels per acre at uh, today's uh, wheat prices and potash prices. And if I use the responsive sites, so I'm gonna do a good job, I'm gonna soil test, I'm gonna identify where I need to use the chloride. If I use those responsive sites, now my economic return, my profit above the cost of chloride is now $20 per acre. So this is a good indication that Chloride is an economic response. It's a relatively low cost input and the responses are highly predictable and we have some simple tools to do that. So this is a good way to make sure you're not missing out on some uh, profitability in your cereal cropping system. All right, so how do we manage chloride? It's uh, fairly simple. Obviously, if we're putting on potash, we get that chloride. But first of all, again, I'll say it again and again, we should soil test. It's recommended by most of the Great Plains institutions that we sample to 24 inch depth where possible because chloride is mobile. It can move down in the soil profile. And, and that chloride in the subsoil is available and particularly important in dryland systems where the topsoil may dry out and we don't have moisture for good root activity. So general guidelines for Montana, if the soil test is less than four parts per million or less than 30 pounds uh, chloride in the top two feet, um, that would be considered deficient and, and merit a chloride application. And you get the 30 pounds per acre simply by multiplying eight, uh, four parts per million by eight which is actually 32, but um, um, so that 30 pound per acre guideline is used by a number of um, university uh, recommendations. The other method we can use is look at leaf chloride concentrations at boot. So if you think, if you, for example, if you see the leaf spot showing up, uh, if you think you might be deficient, say you've had a lot of rainfall, uh, maybe some leaching, um, higher yield potential, and you want to make an in-season diagnostic um, that flag leaf uh, at boot is a good indicator. Um, from Rick Engel's work, uh, he identified a 0.1% as a critical level and, and anything below that would be considered responsive and merit an in-season application. Now, one thing about those in-season applications, you have to remember that at that time of the year, the um, risk of not getting rainfall to move it into the soil um, may be fairly high. So you have to weigh the, the need against the, the potential um, limitations of that. Now, Kansas considers leaf chloride less than 0.2% responsive. So there's a lot of work done in Kansas as well. It's kind of in the same ballpark, but a little bit higher value. They're looking for um, a higher leaf 
concentration, and some studies showed responses um, up to 0.4% leaf colloid. So <clears throat> there is a range of recommendations across the plains, uh, but I would, uh, for Montana, probably want to base your decisions on uh, Montana uh, responses. Now, one thing that has showed up <clears throat> in a lot of the research is that there are fairly large varietal differences among wheat among the wheat varieties. Rick Engel's work in Montana did not observe these large differences. So the genetic pool may be being a little bit different. Um, there was a, a note, however, that varieties that had some Canadian um, genetics in them tended to be uh, a bit more responsive, but just generally speaking, there didn't seem to be a, a big difference in response among the Montana varieties. But some of the work in Kansas, for example, showed um, some varieties producing a 10 to 15 bushel uh, yield response when other varieties produce no response um, in the same um, in the same study. So just uh, something to uh, be alerted to. Okay, so here's an example of a chloride recommendation. This is from uh, Washington State University. Uh, so again, um, they're using that 30 pounds per acre as kind of a critical level. Above that, um, you would not be um, need to apply any chloride uh, at less than 10 pounds per acre in that two foot sample uh, application of about 30 pounds would be recommended. Here's a similar um, recommendation from South Dakota. Now they take a little bit different approach. South Dakota says um, soil plus fertilizer chloride should be 60 pounds. So for example, if your soil test chloride is 30, uh, then 60 minus 30 would recommend an application of uh, 30 pounds per acre. So that aligns pretty well with the Washington and Montana recommendations. So if you're needing to apply chloride, it uh, looks like typically an application in the range of 20 to 30 pounds will be sufficient to correct the deficiency. Okay, so let's take a brief look at some of the sources. Um, obviously, the most common is potassium chloride. We've talked about that, but what if you don't want to pay for potassium that you don't need? Again, Montana has a lot of high, high testing soils. What's my alternative? What if, what if adding more potassium would be have a negative effect, such as a nutrient imbalance? So I want to look for something else. Um, ammonium chloride is probably one of the most common sources um, that is available in Montana. Um, Winfield United has uh, storage for that in Great Falls, and I was told that they are working on some bulk, uh, a bulk chloride storage in the Billings area. Um, not quite ready to release that information yet, but um, they're, um, they said I could say that um, they're working on it. So ammonium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, um, all of these um, have been available in dry sources. Some of them may be available in liquid sources. The challenge with the liquid chloride materials is they're fairly low chloride concentration. So um, you're hauling a lot of water and Montana uh, is um, primarily a dry fertilizer uh, market. So you're probably more looking for the dry sources. These, uh, in terms of performance, uh, the research that's been conducted over the years um, has shown that all of the chloride sources are uh, equivalent in their chloride response. However, you want to look at the accompanying cation, whether it's potassium, ammonium, magnesium, calcium, what do I need? Is it more economical to apply an ammonium chloride where I get some nitrogen and, and um, don't need to apply as much of my other nitrogen source. So there's certainly some things to consider there in the choice of chloride source. As far as the chloride goes, they're all roughly equivalent. So here's a couple of studies, both out of uh, Texas and Kansas, looking at wheat in Texas, sorghum in Kansas. And you can see that uh, when chloride was applied, regardless of source, um, rate was 40 pounds per acre. Um, the yields were similar, but there is a significant yield increase over the check. Uh, in the wheat, we're looking about uh, six to seven bushels, and in the sorghum, roughly 10 bushels. So those are certainly significant and economical responses, um, regardless of the source. So in terms of timing, uh, research has generally shown a little difference among application times. Now, personally, um, 
I, on winter wheat and dry land cropping systems in the plains, I would probably to put it on, uh, probably prefer to put it on in the fall when I'm seeding the wheat, um, because that gives me some time to get some uh, moisture on it, some precipitation, move it down into the root zone, where, as I mentioned, spring applications in the plains, um, you might be subject to some long-term dry periods where the chloride can't uh, doesn't get moved into the subsoil and, and is basically stranded at the surface. So my personal preference um, in the plains would be a fall application. I'm not concerned about overwinter uh, leaching um, in most areas of the plains. So, so fall would be a good time in my opinion. Now on sandy soils or high rainfall areas, or if I'm irrigating, maybe I wanna move that to spring. Um, if I can get some moisture on it, a spring top dress might even be uh, acceptable if um, for some crops, if the deficiency occurs. As far as placement, uh, chloride is soluble, it's mobile in the soil, so broadcast applications work well. It could be banded with other nutrients, but we want to be very careful uh, placing it too close to the seed or placing it with the seed at planting because chloride salts have a high salt index and and there's a high risk of injury in placing it with the seed. It's probably not something we want to do. So broadcast applications work well, So you can, and, and these sources can be blended with other dry materials, um, whether it's nitrogen or phosphate. So chloride fits well in the other application systems that we're using, as long as um, we're careful about uh, putting it with the seed or too close to the seed. All right, I mentioned you can blend these dry sources. Um, the liquids can all be blended with UAN, except for um, we, we should not blend calcium chloride with uh, phosphate solutions. We don't want calcium anywhere close to a phosphate solution. And all of you that handle liquid fertilizers know that that's disaster. But they are completely compatible with UAN solutions. Um, in the past, there have been actually some products that combine uh, a chloride a salt with, uh, with uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, there were some products mm -hmm. that used calcium chloride with urea or UAN. Um, I'm not sure if any of those are available in Montana. I've not heard uh, them to be, uh, but that uh, there were some products like that on the market. But it's convenient to handle. All of our chloride materials are, are easily handled with other dry fertilizers. So I did, uh, again, coming back to this profitability, and I, uh, again, did some more what I call agronomy math. I try to keep it simple. And I simply looked at uh, those same yield increases, the kind of typical yield responses or average yield responses at different wheat prices. Now, fortunately, we're more to the right end of this graph today, uh, but it's not been too long since we were on the left end of this graph. But even looking at $4 wheat and a 2 and a half bushel yield response, um, we're still at uh, a little over $2 per acre uh, profit increase. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but what it shows to me is that even at low crop prices, we're at low risk of economic loss uh, with chloride fertilization. And as we get out here to our current wheat prices and where we're looking at, um, again, if we're targeting according to soil tests and using it in the right places where it's needed, uh, we can look at some very significant uh, yield responses and, and profit increases. So uh, just a way, another way of looking at the profitability factor. And um, when I look at the data, the yield responses, they're very consistent throughout the Great Plains. It is, um, uh, it, it does look like a good investment if our soil test indicates it. Okay, we have a question that's come in. Would you expect to see uh, a bump in yield putting down 30 pounds of uh, potash on canola with soil tests, 300 parts per million K and 10 parts per million chloride. Um, I have not seen, uh, I'm not going to be able to answer this probably for you. I have not seen data looking at chloride response on canola. If, uh, if the soil test is 10 parts per million chloride, however, I'm gonna guess that you're probably not gonna see a response to chloride. I, again, think back to our table, our critical level being about four parts per million. So 10 parts per million is well above that. So I'm thinking uh, probably not gonna get a response to that. Then we have another question here. Um, 
What are your thoughts on crop response based on timing and source of potassium? Does that change anything? Soil tests are in the medium range. Um, I hope my comments um, that uh, about about timing and placement um, previously answered that, but uh, I, I don't really um, I don't really think that um, that that's uh, going to be a, a, a big difference. If the soil test is in the medium range, um, you're simply going to need to apply a less chloride instead of 30 pounds. Maybe, maybe it's uh, 15, 20 pounds per acre rather than rather than the higher rate. So go back to those calibration tables, and I think those are appropriate for um, any of those placements. That would be my thoughts on that. Okay, so anyway, uh, looks like it's a, a good uh, economic um, response if the soil test indicates that it should be applied. Okay, um, I did want to uh, share this. I got permission from Gary Mobs with Winfield United. He shared a calculator with me that they have that you can use to compare sources and and response. And he said that I provided his contact information. He said he would be willing to provide this uh, to anyone who's interested in comparing ammonium chloride with potassium chloride. In the particular example he shared with me, they're, they're very close to equal, but there may be cases where one would be more profitable than another, just depending on your nitrogen needs, your potassium needs, and, and uh, how you want to balance your nutrient application. So if anyone's interested, contact Kerry. Um, and he can also uh, hook you up with supply for ammonium chloride if you're interested. And uh, I told him I would share that uh, because I got some information from him. So uh, his contact is there. Okay, we have another uh, question here. How critical is it to apply potash banded in the soil versus spreading when you're seeking potassium response? Chloride is mobile, but how mobile can we expect K to be in no-till situations? This is a great question. Um, potassium, and here we have a contrast between these two nutrients. Chloride being mobile moves into the soil readily. Potassium being immo immobile will be held on the exchange complex and does not move into the soil as well. And for this reason, in no-till soils, we often see what we call stratification. And I know Klain's going to talk about that in terms of pH and liming and some of those same principles applied to potassium. It's held on the exchange complex, so we actually can get enrichment at the soil surface. As the roots mine potassium from the subsoil, and then we deposit the crop residue on the surface, we tend to get enrichment at the surface and, and potassium um, accumulation there. So if that's occurring and the subsoil becomes depleted, now many of our soils, that might be a long time before that occurs, but if the subsoil becomes depleted, of potassium, uh, subsurface banding um, may be a better way to apply it. So if you can in no-till, um, I like banding personally of most nutrients. I think there are a variety of benefits to that. To that, So, so particularly where, where we're in no-till, if you can band it um, at seeding, particularly that, that can be uh, a preferred application. Okay, um, I think uh, we're almost out of time. So I, I had a Washington State study here and I'm just gonna skip through that quickly. Uh, it was a pretty comprehensive study. They had sources and timing and rates and all different things. So just wanna show you a couple things from that. Here was fall versus spring. Uh, obviously uh, this was at uh, Pullman and they're growing in a high yield environment. Uh, most of the rainfall um, in um, Eastern Washington comes over winter. So uh, in the spring, things start to dry out. So uh, this is not a large difference, but it was statistically significant. And as we know, four bushels is economically significant um, with chloride. So um, again, an example, I think um, this supports my preference for fall application in dryland wheat. Uh, again, they looked at sources. Uh, again, in this case, there was no statistical difference between ammonium chloride and potassium chloride, but looking at uh, eight to 10 bushel uh, response overall to chloride treatments. All right, so um, 
and average yield response of, of all their treatments. They looked at different varieties. And, and again, I, I mentioned that in some states there have been variety differences. And you can see that um, here in these, the Falcon um, was a bit more um, lower yielding, but fairly large response and the Finch didn't respond, didn't respond at all to chloride. All right, so let's just wrap up and then we'll have a, um, a minute or two for any extra questions. Um, the studies uh, on chloride, uh, with chloride fertilization in cereals in the Great Plains have been very consistent from Canada to the Pacific Northwest of the Great Plains. All of the grasses seem to be responsive, but particularly wheat and barley is where much of the work has been done. Even grass seed in the Willamette Valley was responsive. In some cases, there have been variety differences, but as I mentioned, Rick Engel didn't feel that there was a, a merit in trying to make that distinction in Montana. The data didn't support those differences, but just something to be aware of. Uh, again, I will say, I believe these responses to chloride and potassium to be uh, predictable and profitable. Um, soil test, soil test, soil test is our best indicator of these and, and helps us to avoid that deficiency from occurring um, in the first place so we don't have to make um, the more risky in-season applications. I want to thank uh, Dr. Blaylock for um, giving us his time and for uh, presenting for us today. Um, and Jake, I'll, sorry to interrupt you, I've, I've yep. noted some additional uh, sources for additional reading. If anyone's interested in those, there's some websites there with some additional information that, that they can consult as well. Um, okay, appreciate it. Again, thank you, Dr. Blaylock. Um, we want to thank, uh, thank all of you for attending and joining us for the Great Montana Egg Rally Session 1. Uh, we hope you found this session to be informative and helpful. Thank you to Al, Mr. Dr. Alan Blaylock and Nutrium for their support of MABA and Session 1. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate it. Have a great day.